good afternoon, everybody. And uh, while you're all still talking to me, I think I'd like to say thank you very much for this wonderful workshop and the great interactions that I've had. Um, so why might you not stop? Why might you stop talking to me, sir? I'm going to talk a little bit about science and science and sorcery and put some challenges out to us as, as, as people who are scientists and as the academies to reflect more carefully on what it is that we do and what it is that we're going to be doing when we make the call for action that we've talked about today. Let me start by thinking about that call for action. Uh, who are we calling upon? Well, I guess that's the scientists, the science communities, the funders of science, and obviously the users of science. What are we calling for? Well, I guess we're calling for more support. That's typically what academics do. We would like more support. And possibly we might like to see our work used more carefully in the design of policies for poverty reduction. Um, and we'd like to see it at least recognized as an important item, an important source of evidence for decision making, if, not the only, if it cannot be the only source of information. Um, So, uh, Professor Sachs has put up this cheerful slide, um, which suggests that perhaps we don't have a problem. Um, extreme poverty is steadily de declining, and we might be able to move away from the thought of having to deal with poverty, and perhaps there isn't a problem to solve. I think Professor Sachs thinks there is a problem, and I certainly agree with him. Um, I'd like to suggest that we might want to phrase our problem to be solved is that the contribution made by science for the sustainable reduction of poverty has been inadequate and is sometimes the cause of poverty production. As absolute poverty is morally unacceptable and economically inefficient, and relative poverty is politically and ecologically unsustainable, we need further action by the scientific community. My evidence? I'd like to start with this slide. Um, this is a photograph taken in an area called Agaboshi. It's in Accra, Ghana. It's described as the most polluted place in the planet. Um, here, young men like this burn um, digital waste to extract the precious metals. So it's a, it's, a, it's a quite alarming environment. I visited there in February this year. For this young man, this probably, given the jobs crisis that Professor Sachs mentioned, may be his only future. This is the job which he's confronting. Um, in addition, we need to think about that this is a spin-off, this is an outcome, an unintended outcome of our policies to try and promote the ICTs that we're also hoping might solve our poverty reduction problem. This is the detritus of ICT development that these young people are, are, are dealing with. So maybe that image is not enough, maybe I haven't convinced you. There are the shipbreakers of India. Um, Yesterday we heard about the poor of Japan, and I had a discussion with our colleague from Germany about poverty in Germany, and yes, poverty is there too. Now I'm willing to put my dollar that all of these people earn more than a dollar. And if we were to think of ourselves as focusing on extreme poverty, perhaps then these aren't the people we should be concerned about. I doubt anyone, any of us here would decide that that's an appropriate conclusion that although they are above a dollar a day, although they are not extreme poor, this poverty matters to, ought to matter to us. So, who then do we focus upon and I'd like to, and why does it matter? So, an important debate that happened some years back in the poverty community was a debate between Peter Townsend and Amata Sen. It took place in the Oxford Economic Papers. Peter Townsend, I think, summed up very nicely why it matters which definition of poverty we use and how we conceptualize poverty. As he says, this implies an implicit explanation of the phenomenon and the prescription of policy that we want to talk about. So we need to think quite carefully when we decide which type of poverty we are focusing on and why it matters. Um, now, I put this slide up so to reassure those of you that poverty researchers don't simply think about poverty as a money metric possible, as a money metric option. There are many other ways in which we might think about poverty. Here are two, two, two contributions by John Finnis and Martha Nussbaum, both philosophers, who are thinking not just about poverty but what constitutes well-being. 
Um, I could talk about this and I could spend some time thinking, explaining to you why I think a dollar a day or a dollar fifty or two dollars or indeed forty dollars as somebody has proposed are not necessarily particularly productive ways of going about thinking about, about poverty. But I would like to focus particularly now on relative poverty and explain why I think that matters. So, why does absolute poverty matter? That's quite easy. We can decide, I think, I can put to you why I think there is a moral reason why we ought to be concerned about absolute poverty, the kind of dollar a day, two dollar a day approach. This is the quite well-known Preston curve, comes from demography, and essentially it's arguing that it, as you get incremental increases in, in well-being, you get increases in life expectancy, and at some point there's a kink in the curve where an extra dollar on it does not act, 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 um, add much in terms of an extra year of life. So therefore, that kink point is not a bad place to think about a poverty line. I think we can all agree it's ethically correct to say that we need to get people to the point where they're earning enough money not to be able to live an extra year of life. And beyond that, we may, not be, we may be less concerned because that money is not adding years of life. Uh, I think the data are quite interesting. They show it's historical data, and it shows the change in my own country, South Africa, um, and the rather alarming red dot, the 2000 dot of South Africa uh, over there, was the result of our bungling of HIV and AIDS, where our life expectancy fell despite the fact that we were increasing income. So there's a nice moral justification. We can come up with a poverty line. It turns out that line is quite a lot above the dollar a day, two dollar a day limit. It's around three dollars, um, but it gives us a moral justification. Economically, well, here's an economic justification. Um, I th would like to suggest, as we heard several times yesterday, that poor people are extremely rational actors. They're very good at figuring out how to make things work. They have economic projects which can be sustainable. But if people are so poor that they're unable to invest in those projects, or if they're invested in, in an environment which is so insecure that when they do invest, things always go wrong, they're eventually going to, like our friend here, Mr. McCorber, from Charles Dickens. I have always thought Dickens was one of the greatest policy researchers that, that the world has seen, um, where your, your schemes don't work out. And to re-quote Charles Dickens, you wind up having rational but not great expectations. You adjust your behavior. This means that economically viable projects, projects that could contribute towards the growth of a country, don't happen. People avoid those projects. So that's an economic justification of why we might want to think about absolute poverty. Okay, so I've made that case. Let me think now, try and make a case for relative poverty. Here's Peter Townsend's also retort here in that debate about what relative poverty is, where he says we need to think about a kind of poverty which it means that you are unable to participate in the normal states, the normal activities of a society. He added there, and this was in 1979, nearly 30, over 30 years ago, things which are in customary or widely encouraged or improved in the societies in which we belong. We're now living in a world where everybody is encouraged to consume, um, where consumption has become an, an important mode of supporting economic growth, and thus people are aspiring to have more and more. Um, I was quite struck in the discussion that, that we had yesterday, I think, um, when Lynn Shui talked about, her, and obviously she was using this as a metaphor, if the, to encourage the Chinese to eat more meat. So I did a little bit of, uh, of, of, of uh, e-envelope e calculations, thinking, well, what if the Chinese were to take that seriously and were to think it was, were, were, were an appropriate route? What if the Chinese were to change their meat consumption to that of Germans? Um, and my little calculation, I, I just picked Germans because we didn't have, we, at that stage, I don't think we had any from America in the room, and the consumption there is very, meat consumption is extraordinarily high. But the suggestion is that we would need, let me see, we would need an extra 163 billion cows each year. All right, so that's if the Chinese wanted to consume the meat of Germans. And if the Nigerians decided to do the same, and they would take their 8.8 .8 kilograms per capita up to the 88 kilograms per capita, we'd increase that further. And if the statistics, the science is to be believed, we'd have another 22 billion kilograms of methane gas emitted each year. So I think that's one of the reasons why there was that intake of breath about that idea of getting the Chinese to eat like Germans. But let's just think about that for the moment. Um, is it politically acceptable to say that the standards of the world are one for Germans and another for the Chinese, or one for Nigerians and another for the Americans? And uh, 
Now, as a South African, and having grown up in the era of apartheid, I would find that a quite difficult recommendation to think about. And as Professor Sachs mentioned, the geopolitics of the world have changed, that that probably no longer is a possible approach. We really cannot imagine the idea of a global apartheid about what is, what is poor for one and what is poor for another. So for that reason, I tend to say we need to think quite carefully then about a relative poverty line, which starts to talk about the needs of the society that you have and recognizes that those needs, those demands, are going to change over time. So, I now need to take off my academic mortar, and we heard yesterday that academic scientists wear many hats, and I'll try and put on the hat of uh, the balaclava of an activist for a little bit for my last little bit of this talk. Um, for those of us who get involved in trying to persuade policymakers to change their minds, um, we are continually confronting, I think, very, different, very difficult choices. How do we convey ourselves? How do we convey our message? I didn't know about the situation of the European Scientific Advisor until it was brought up here. I, I had not come across that discussion, but I read about Anne Glover, and I found it quite interesting in some of the articles, some of the attacks that were taking place, where Anne Glover was described as the high priestess. And I also thought I needed to read more about Geoffrey Sachs, and I found that Professor Sachs is sometimes described as the guru or the vizier, the grand vizier of poverty. Now, I'm quite sure that both Anne and Jeffrey find those descriptions quite distasteful. But I must say, when I thought about it and I reflected upon those, uh, those ideas of how we are portrayed as policy analysts, how often myself, interacting with the South African or other African governments, have had to don the gear of the shaman. In a sense, you're now the wise person. You have to portray and convey your message to policymakers in a way that they seem to be, think is credible. We, uh, we, we give our sermons in our, our op-eds to, the, to, the, to, the, to people that we hope will take on that wisdom. We cast bones when we, throw, when we try and predict scenarios. And I think one quite striking thing you do as a shaman is that you worry that some other shaman, some great high priestess or grand vizier from the World Bank won't arrive wearing brighter feathers than your own and undo the work that you've been doing trying to persuade, trying to whisper into the ears of the policymakers. This is a rather worrying thing that we have to, think, that we have to deal with, um, because it alerts us to the politics of trying to talk about poverty. And we've spoken about that politics all the time. Uh, this is an article written in the year that I was born in South Africa, um, where it was trying to, in this instance, this was an activist group in the 1960s, arguing about the unsustainability of apartheid. And Throughout that period that I grew up and we attended university, politics and poverty have been inextricably entwined. We cannot divorce these two ideas from one another. And I think that is the challenge here for this group because we really have to confront something that has been talked about for a long time. Here's a, a 1957 article talking about poverty researchers in the 19th century and trying to query what are the motives, what are the reasons, what are the things that go through our heads when we're trying to advise on poverty. And I think that he, he, this argues a quite careful rethinking of what we have to consider when we stand up and pronounce about how poverty should be reduced. Largely, I think all of us coming from the middle class and largely bringing our particular ideas about what poverty is and whose, whose fault it is. So I like the idea that this is talked about correcting the costs and inefficiencies of social wastage. Remember, this is talking about the social reforms of the 19th century, not the century. So, to end then, to think about the content of our call for action. Uh, I'm one of those academics who have recently had the privilege to work for a, a really fine vice-chancellor at my new university at Western Cape, Professor Brian O'Connell. He says the messages that you, as, uh, us as scientists should be conveying are twofold. One, we need to be persuading people who live in high-income countries that they need to prepare themselves for a more humble future. Things cannot go on as they are. So the development problem is not necessarily that of Brazil or South Africa. Perhaps the development problem is that of J Japan or Germany. I think that's quite striking when you, when you consider the presentation we had yesterday from Japan, which suggests that humble future is already happening. The second thing is that we need to persuade those living in low- and middle-income countries that we cannot seek to emulate the, the, the pathway of developed countries. It's no longer possible. We're going to have to find other ways of dealing with welfare and not understanding what welfare is in South Africa.
Because of the few comments in Africa, I wanted to add my own one, and that is to also recognize that we need to persuade those in Africa and those outside of Africa that Africa is neither a basket case nor is it a golden goose, which can be pillaged by ourselves often, and we actually need to recognize that Africa as a shared responsibility. I very much appreciated Ernst's con con contribution because in some ways that poses Africa possibly as the solution of problems rather than the cause of problems. So I will end there with Social Science of Sorcery, a book which influenced me when I was a, a first year student, and suggest one of the calls that we need to be making is how to, how to deal with confused thinking. How, as Stanislav Andreski, a British um, so, um, social scientist argued, how, that, how to avoid confused thinking that leads nowhere in particular. One of this might be to start thinking about what as, as my students refer to as weasel words. Words which sound knowledgeable but actually mean nothing in particular. And we need to think about in our call for, our call for action, are there any weasel words that we should avoid and what would be more appropriate words to insert? Thank you. Thank you.